This is season five, episode five, almost at the halfway point of the regular season. I am Corey Doviak, being joined by my illustrious panel of North Jersey football insiders, starting with the venerable one. He is Jimmy Abitabile. What's going on, Jimmy? Hey, what's up, Corey? I think we're all a little uh, hungover after the action in the past uh, uh, four days. So, uh, long weekend, but a, a very good weekend. Yes, absolutely, and that is the proper term, because I'm tired tonight. The game's Thursday, game's Friday, game's Saturday, game's Sunday. No one in North Jersey was at more of them than our other North Jersey football insider. Now, I called Jimmy Avatable. You know, he's a gentleman of the game. He's been around. He, he knows everybody. Venerable suits him. So I think I'll go with, uh, for our other guy here, the crazy one. He is Brian Carr. What's going on, Brian? Hey, thank you, Corey. Hey, um, just to clarify things, this is episode number four. You're getting ahead of ourselves here, uh, <laughs> the crazy one says. Uh, yes, it was great. I, I got to four games this past weekend. I didn't get to Sunday. You guys are crazy. You guys went Sunday. I, I wasn't the crazy one. Well, listen. Yeah, good weekend. It was really good, but things are starting to shake out. We're really starting to see who's who out there right now. Um, so it's, it's kind of fun right now. Yes, well, I call you the crazy one, but I also know that I live in a glass house. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, things. Uh, they, they, it was it was a football smorgasbord this past weekend. We got to a bunch of stuff, which means we got a great show for tonight. Our guest this evening is going to be the Bergen Catholic head coach, Nunzio Campanile. Uh, they, they came off a huge win over St. Joe's. You know, they went out to California two weeks ago got smoked a little bit, and then came back to Jersey, and people were asking some questions, and all they've done is righted the ship uh, to put themselves right back in a position uh, to make a run at a state title. So we're going to talk to him about that, and then we're going to go around the leagues. As I mentioned, we have we were at so many games this past week. There's stories all over NorthJerseySports.com, pictures all over NorthJerseySports.com, but we also collected a lot of audio from the games that we were at. So we will touch on the small schools, we have sound from New Milford's win over Pompton Lakes at uh, Pompton Lakes and a Friday matinee, which was fun. We have sound from Demarest's win over uh, Bergenfield in a game that I was at. And we have sound from Thursday night's game, Old Japan's fourth straight win to start the season uh, back Thursday. Seems like a long time ago now. But we're going to stick on this Bergen Catholic St. Joe's thing. Before we bring Nunzio on, I want to talk about it a little bit uh, between ourselves here because, Bri, you were there, you wrote the story for NorthJerseySports.com, and you got some quotes. So why don't you just give us, you know, uh, St. Joe's off to a fast start. Bergen Catholic did everything after that. Yeah, um, I think every, we heard it on the sidelines or on after the game. I think the big turning point for Bergen, we'll ask the coach tonight, the big turning point was probably in the fourth, second half of last week's game against um, Don Bosco at home, where they had to kind of come back there. So I think everybody's talking about that as being the comeback uh, for them. But I was looking back, too. The similar scenario in this game to the DePaul game we saw, opening game, where they got behind early and then came on in midway and then just kind of took off in the second half. So uh, they seem to have gotten that offensive line going. I think that's what I noticed, too. The line play, we talked about that in preseason. We said, hey, they got to have the line play. Looks like they brought that together. You know, you can see with all the rushing yards, they really were dominating as, as we're going to hear from uh, Johnny Football, Johnny Football saying, hey, we smashed those guys in the face. Well, you mentioned Johnny Football, Johnny Langan. We might as well jump in then. You set up the quote. Here's what Johnny Langan had to say after the game. Brian Carr here. I'm with Johnny Football for Burton Catholic. Johnny Langan. Johnny, big game, big rivalry. Comments, thoughts about the game? I mean, uh, anytime you beat St. Joe's, uh, it's a great rivalry, and it just, uh, just no, not much better feelings than this. Right. Talk about your offensive line. I think that was the key to the game. 
I think. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, the offensive line smashed me in the mouth off the off the run game and uh, gave me time in the pocket when I had to throw. Right, right. A couple good passes for yeah. you out there. You know, some yeah. swing passes. Big play, I think, in the game, probably a key play. Yeah. Late in the game, you guys are up by eight. You need to steal it. Third and eight, eight play, it's the only on the side down. there. Yeah. 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 What did you guys do? Anything special? What did you you guys know that that was going to be open? How did you know that was going to be there for you? Well, I mean, they've they playing uh, soft on him all day after he caught that uh, big post on him over the middle. So uh, we knew that they were going to give us that pass. Right. And he, what do you think? Talk about your lineman. Tell me about some of the guys on the line. I mean, Brian Felter, Sean Toomey, Kevin Kennerson, uh, Zakir Faith, uh, J.R. Woods. Right. Just all just tr- tremendous, tremendous football players. And uh, they, they've been really great for us this year. Have you gotten to see St. Peter's yet? That should be a big game for you guys in a couple weeks. Yeah, I mean, it's two weeks out. We just need a... Uh, everyone needs to um, have a great bye week. You know, everyone needs to be fresh on, on next Monday. And uh, we just got to, um, you know, do our thing because we're unstoppable and we do our thing. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate your time, Johnny. All right, Brian, good stuff there with Johnny Langan. And you were doing the rounds after the game. You got a bunch of interviews. Uh, why don't you set up this one, Dylan Classy, who had a big game uh, on the outside catching balls. Uh, Bergen Catholic was able to run it. They were able to throw it. And uh, you talk about it. Hey, Dylan is really one of Johnny's, I think, go-to guys. Um, there's the one run he had, it was short, maybe 10 yard run. The kid basically ran across the field, cut through everybody. Uh, he seems to be able to find the ball at every play. When the ball's coming in, he goes and gets it. He's a, like a center fielder in the baseball team, but he gets the balls and he's very, um, nifty out in the field and gets around his, the runners, the defenders, scores easy. You caught up with him after the game and here's Dylan Classy's interview here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. Brian Carr here with Dylan Classy at Burton Catholic. Talk about the game, Dylan. You know, year in and year out, it's one of the best games all year. And practiced hard all week, came out on top, and that's it. You know, they played hard. They're a well-coached team. We just made some plays, and that's it, you know. Talk about your offensive line. I think that was a big difference in the game, that they were able to control the line of scrimmage for you guys. Absolutely. The offensive line won us that game. They controlled the line of scrimmage. You know, when we needed, when we, we were running the ball, they knew we were running the ball, and they, they stepped up big time. That's, you know, talk props about, to them. Talk about a big play in the fourth quarter. You guys were up by eight, and it was third and like eight here, and he, there was a pass for you, and that made the difference. It kind of sealed the game. Remember that play? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, you know, we practice that all the time in practice, so it's a routine. But like I said, you know, it's a dog fight. It certainly was. You know, score didn't indicate that, but they're a well-coached team. They're one of the best teams in the state, and you know, we just came out on top today. Talk about your kicker, Carney. He's uh, kicked two good field Absolutely. goals here. Absolutely. He's, he's, he did a great job today. You know, he made all his field goals. He stepped up, and I'm proud of him. I really am. All right, Brian, good stuff there with Dylan Classy, and we're going to get to Coach Nunzio here in a second. But, Jimmy, you know, uh, we'll touch a little bit more on the non-publics here before we get to our interview tonight. Uh, my question for you is, what have we learned about the big boys here five weeks into the season? Well, you know, Cor, what we learned in five seasons, I think, every, uh, excuse me, five weeks, I think every team has moved up and down out of that number one perch. I mean, Bergen started there, they dropped down after their week two and three loss, and then St. Joe's moved up, and now they're down, and Peters is up, and it's just a, you know, topsy-turvy kind of season, and it's going to continue, you know, for the next five or six weeks. Yeah, it's interesting. St. Peter's prep with a 23-14 to win over Paramus Catholic this week. PC, the defending champ, is 2-3 and on the year. St. Peter's prep improved to 3-1, and 3-0 and in the state. Uh, their only loss, you know, coming out of state uh, earlier this season. But then it sets up an interesting week here, Jimmy, because you got St. Peter's prep against DePaul. Now, DePaul has been, you know, trying to uh, crack this top group, and they have cracked this top group this year, so they get right back at it this year with a with another chance for a statement victory, DePaul. And if, they, if DePaul wins, maybe we make a case for them as the number one team in the state. It's hard to figure. You know, DePaul might be the hottest team out of all of them, the, the big six. I mean, they lost to Bergen opening weekend. They came back. They've beaten Bosco. They've beaten uh, uh <laughs> Excuse me. They beat uh, last week. They beat Hudson Catholic forty-eight-seven in a in a non-competitive game. Yep. And they're just they're on a roll right now. I mean, you go back to the Paramus Catholic game. Paramus Catholic was up fourteen nothing in the first quarter over St. Peter's. Uh, St. Peter's had turned the ball over and gave Paramus Catholic great field position. But to St. Peter's credit, they come back. They score the next twenty-three points, and they're set you know in a good position. Paramus Catholic losers of the last two. It could have been three in a row to. 
and if it wasn't for an overtime win against uh, Seton Hall Prep. So, you know, Paramus Catholic's struggling a little bit on offense, and they go out to Pope John, another team that's 4 0. So, it's another interesting weekend in, in big boy parochial football. Yeah, it certainly is. Brian, did you. I noticed in the tweet you said you were stuck in traffic in Jersey City trying to get into Cave and Point during the President's Cup being played down there. But did you, how much of that game did you see? Oh, we um, it was a ride getting over there because we came out of Plumpton Lakes and uh, <laughs> it, we had a dodge around. It took forever. We couldn't get in the main parking lot and they got, they're closed off. We sat and we were lucky. We happened I happen to have one of my WCTV colleagues and. Uh, Bobby gets out of the car and says, WCTV, the guy opens the gate, there we go. We end up right behind the scoreboard. So we got VIP, you just have to be patient. You know, that <laughs> VIP stuff, you know, you get your press pass, it gets you some, uh, and the same thing in Ber- the other day, too. In Bergen, you pull in, the press, they let you in. So uh, some of the privileges of being in the press here. Bro. Yeah. But uh, the game, the game, like Jimmy said, I think the game itself, uh, I kind of expected Peters, you know, we expect Peters, Peters seems to be the dominating program right now. Um, and you saw PC come out, take advantage of some mistakes by Peters. Um, and then you, after that, you saw uh, Prem's Catholic's offense really was kind of struggling. Uh, and then St. Peter's got in the groove and was able to score their points with their offense. So, um, you know, they seem to be a really solid program. But I, like Jimmy said, I think it's going to be a good game against DePaul. I think you're going to see a very competitive game. Uh, but now DePaul's got a visit. They're going down to Jersey City. So it should be an interesting game. No doubt. You know, PC 2-3 and three at this point of the season, but still not out of it by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, DePaul 3-1 and one headed to St. Peter's Prep. Don Bosco Prep got back on the winning track. They're 2-3 and three after they handled Del Barton pretty easily. And then the other one was the 41-30 win Bergen Catholic over St. Joseph Regional, which we're going to get into a little bit deeper right now on this edition of the Monday Morning Quarterback. As we welcome in Bergen Catholic head coach Nunzio Campanile. Coach, thanks for joining us here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. Thanks for having me. Now, we have a lot of questions to ask you, but the first one I want to ask you is, what was the best line delivered tonight at the Bergen Catholic Crusaders Touchdown Club get-together this evening? Uh, the Touchdown Club was pretty tame, but our staff meeting had a couple <laughs> chuckles in it for sure. You know, it's, a, it's always better to meet after a win, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you talk about a win... Uh, one that is always a big one for you guys. Bergen Catholic, St. Joseph Regional, one of the hottest rivalries in North Jersey football. So just uh, give us a quick overview, uh, you know, here a day or two later. And when you look back on it, what, what worked for you? Well, you know, I, I think that we really executed very well on offense. We had great ball distribution. Our linemen really got off the ball. You know, they, just, they seem to be getting better every week. And, you know, because of that, we were able to kind of spread the ball out, stay ahead of the chains, and uh, we were able to stay in our game plan the whole game, which uh, really obviously helped us out. And then on defense, I think we made some really big stops when we needed to. They got some really talented guys on offense. They're pretty physical up front. And, uh, you know, I thought we did a pretty good job hanging in there and, you know, making the plays we needed to make. Absolutely. Jimmy, go ahead. Yeah, Coach, you mentioned your, your staff meetings. You have two big additions to your staff. Obviously, Coach Greg Toll, former Don Bosco head coach, and Fred Stengel, former Bergen Catholic coach. If you can, let us know what they have brought to the program, uh, obviously with the coaching staff and for the kids. Well, you know, it's funny. We, we were actually talking this morning about, you know, the, the three of us were talking about how, you know, they're, they feel like they're kind of hitting their stride in the staff where, you know, they don't feel like, you know, they feel comfortable enough really sharing their opinion and, you know, inserting themselves where it's really important. And, you know, you, where you really see it is in the, the stress on fundamentals, the stress on execution. You know, ultimately, you know, we all know that football is really won and lost by blocking and tackling who executes better. And they're both tremendous fundamental coaches, and they've been in so many big games that they know that, that you know, that's what you win on, you know, schemes and all that. But, you know, you need to be able to, to execute better than the other team. And, they're bringing that to practice. Uh, they bring great energy every day. I think they're really excited to be able to just coach football and not worry about the other nonsense. And, uh, you know, and obviously they're both great coaches and, uh, they're having a great impact on the players. They're having a great impact on the staff. You know, Nuds, we, well, this summer we got wind of the, uh, staff changes. You know, we broke the Fred Stangle angle of it. We had the Greg Toll part of it earlier. We let the, 
publication formerly known as the Bergen Record or whatever is going on over there. We let them jump on that. But, you know, when we were talking about it amongst ourselves, I, I think it showed a lot uh, of your character because, you know, if, if those guys come aboard and you win, it's like, oh, you look at Bergen Catholic. They, they got Stangleback. They got uh, Toll. And they win. And if you lose, it's like, oh, you know, they can't even win with those guys. I mean, I, I think it took a lot for you. Or you tell me how, what your thinking was about it before it all went down or when you were contemplating it or presented with the idea here. But I, I thought it was you really put your ego aside to take those two guys on and and just, you know, uh, do what you thought, I guess, was right for your team and your program. Well, that's my job. I mean, my job is, you know, to give our team, our players, our school the best chance to win a championship. And, you know, if we have an opportunity to bring in coaches that are going to positively impact our kids and our program, I would be foolish not to do that. And, you know, anything, uh, if I allowed anything uh, from the outside to affect that, then I really wouldn't be doing my job. And then on top of that, you know, I worked with Coach Toll uh, for yeah. 10 years. I've known him since I'm, I don't even know. I, I went to his football camp when I was 12 years old. Uh, we have a great relationship. We believe all the same things about football. So I, I knew that that would work well. He, he's never been a guy that's big on, you know, who gets the credit. It's really just been about, you know, uh, trying to help our team win. And, and, you know, Coach Stengel and I have worked side by side for seven years teaching phys ed together here. We've talked a lot of football, and, you know, I, I think what we found is, you know, we have a lot of common ground, and because of that, uh, I, I knew it would work out really well, and, I, you know, I think it will, I think we'll just continue to get better. Yeah, well, it, it, it seems it's working out. Brian, go ahead. You were at the game, Brian. Why don't you talk a little bit about the game? Well, here, I had one question before I give my question. One thing. I heard um, the players talking to Coach Toll after the game, and they asked, talked about him dancing in the locker room after the game. Did he, <laughs> did he actually do his dance in the locker room? I was on the field, but supposedly there was a little dancing going on in the locker room. Him and Marquise Morris were getting after it a little bit. So uh, I don't know that he still got the moves that he used to have before those knee replacements. But, uh, but he, was, he was cutting it up from what I heard. Is there any video of this uh, around? Can, can you point us to a social media channel where we might be able to watch such a spectacle? <laughs> we want to go see the video, yeah. So, so, hey, my question, coaches. So we were talking about, and you may have heard questions there, and I, we were talking about, too, the turning point for you guys. Everybody was talking about I think you mentioned. Talk about the turning point. I think it was the Pramus Catholic game um, in the second half uh, that seemed to be a turning point that helped your, you know, get that game going and then came into this game. Um, and then also your offensive lines, obviously, offensive, defensive lines. Well, you know, I, I think in the fourth quarter of the Paramus Catholic game, uh, our line and, and Josh McKenzie in particular kind of really started to take over that game. And we got a little momentum, and Johnny and Ramirez jumped in there and made a couple big runs. And I think we got a, a little confidence going there, and we've just kind of built from it. So it has been a, a, you know, a big difference maker for us. Our kids have learned that, you know, hey, just stay the course, keep playing hard. And, you know, I think they've also learned to expect all the games to be great games. Uh, you know, that's one of the big things. You know, in the beginning of the year, everybody wanted to tell us how great we were going to be. And the truth is, it, every game is a coin flip. You know, you better go into it expecting uh, that every game is going to be a knockdown, dragout battle. And our guys are starting to understand that. Don't be surprised it's a great game in the fourth quarter. Hey, the other one, another coach, um, I noticed looking back at the Paul game and this game, seemed to be something similar. You guys go down early. Um, just close. You know, the first game you were down like eight seven. I think the Paul last game you were down sixteen seven. You guys came back. This game scored seventeen unanswered. So, what do you think you guys did to turn it on there, um, executing different, or what you guys do different? Well, you know, I think that goes back to what I was just saying. That guys understand every game is going to be a battle. You can't panic when you get down. You just have to keep playing. A couple things that we really rely on. We know that we're in great shape. Uh, our guys work really hard. We condition all year long. And, you know, we believe that when the game's tough late in the game, you know, we're in great position to win. So, you know, we were able to get the lead in both of those games in the second quarter uh, and then maintain it throughout. But every time the game got close, like the of the day, got an eight-point game and they had a chance uh, to, you know, to tie it. And, uh, you know, we were able to build it back to a two-score lead. I, I think the fact that our guys, one, they can trust their conditioning, and two, uh, they're used to being in great games. They're used to playing tough teams, so they're not shocked that it's a great game. Uh, you know, they were able to just stay after it and, and trust in what they're being coached to do and uh, trust in one another. Jimmy, you got another one? 
Yeah, uh, coach, you know, obviously game one against the ball, you went out there, you really threw the ball all over the place. But, you know, you, you lift the scoreboard up throwing the ball, and then obviously against St. Joe's, you go out to run for just under 300 yards. Talk about how important it is to be able to do both as you try to win a state championship. Uh, well, I, you know, I always, when I go out and speak about our offense, I always talk about balance, and one of the things that I believe it balance is not being 50-50 every game. It's having the ability to take what the defense gives you, and I think that we have the type of team that really can do that. Uh, we, we're much better on the offensive line right now than we've been the last few years, and with that, you know, we have the ability to hopefully run the ball, uh, you know, when that's presented to us, but we also have the athletes outside that they can make plays. If, you know, if they're going to give us the matchups, we can throw it around. And I think that's really critical, especially, you know, being able to run the ball as the weather gets cold and you get into late November and December, you know, it's really hard to win around here if you, if you can't run the football at that time of year. Yeah, no doubt. Unless you get a warm week, uh, weekend evening at the Meadowlands like we got last year, but you can't count on that for sure. Last one, Coach, and then we will yeah, let you out. on that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last one, then we'll let you out of here tonight, uh, tonight, and we appreciate you coming on. You know, I think it was two years ago we had you on the show, and it was an interesting conversation about where high school football was heading. The line that you use then and that I've been using since uh, is that in your schedule and in your league, it's best on best every week. There are no breaks. I mean, you guys add to that, you went and played the number one team in the country out in California and came back without a bye week and played again. But, you know, things have changed since we last had the conversation yeah, just your thoughts on where high school football is going here. I mean, you know, people talk about numbers being down, uh, so many different storylines around football. Not that it's affecting the non-publics as much as the publics, but, you, you know, you've been around the game your entire life, as you mentioned earlier. Just your thoughts on the state of high school football right now. Well, you know, it's really a complex question, because there's so many different factors. You know, I have an 11 year old playing football. I have a five year old playing flag football. And, you know, what I see already at their age, guys specializing in sports. You know, there are some people that are concerned about the injury risks in football, but a lot of it has to do with, you know, people are specializing way too early. I think way too many people are playing for reasons other than I just want to have fun and player. I think, you yeah. know, there's so many people thinking it's about getting a scholarship or taking it to the NFL, which is, just kind of ludicrous you know like I, I hope my kids learn the lessons i learned playing football i think it's the greatest team sport you could ever imagine um so but i i think the level of play is tremendous i you know like in our league it's tremendous and i bounce around and try and see as many games as i can i love to pop in and see a good you know public school game you know I, it, while they're different it's the same there's a lot of great players out there the, the work that kids are putting into it it's tremendous. Uh, the level of talent in our league is tremendous, and it's also really spread out. Um, you know, so I, I think there are the kids that love football aren't aren't shying away from it. They're working harder than ever before. The coaches are working as hard, if not harder, than ever before. So uh, I think there's a lot of great football out there. You know, I, I'm curious where it goes with. You know, uh, there's a lot of concern about rankings and playing on TV and all that stuff, but. I just think that the things you get out of playing football are, are second to none. You know, I mean, they, you know, sacrificing, you know, your personal accomplishment for the success of the team. There's nothing like that, you know. And I, I think when kids learn to give themselves up for the team is a tremendous thing. It's really hard to do in, in, like in our league and our, in our schools. And I'm really proud that our kids really buy into that. I think it's really important. And, you know, I, I, that's what I hope my sons learn playing football. So, uh, well, I think there's a lot going on. I still think football is headed in a great place. I think there's so many great people involved in it. Uh, you know, I look forward to seeing my kids grow up to be football players. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you said it well. There, there are, and you said it's a complex question, and really there, there's a, a, a million complex questions within that same question. So it, it is going to be interesting. Sure. I, I tell a lot of people, you know, walking around covering high school sports is such an interesting time to be doing it because it's just, you know, it, you feel like, the pendulum is swinging. You're not sure where it's going, but it, it's certainly swinging. And I'm not just talking about football. I'm talking about high school sports in general. But anyway, now all that stuff's for another day. We appreciate you, uh, as always, taking out a couple of minutes here and joining us on the Monday Morning Quarterback. And because we have Brian Carr on staff, and he goes to 1.4 million games per season, we will see you again before it's all over. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. 
I appreciate it. Good, good, good luck, Dunson. Thanks again. Right. Uh, great stuff there, as always, with the Bergen Catholic head coach, Nunzio Campanile. Uh, let's move on now. Let's talk about some other things. We've taken care of big boy football at the first part of this show, and we will keep it on a steady rotation uh, going forward here. We're not favoring any one group of teams over another. But, Bry, as we've mentioned many times on this show, it was an action-packed weekend of sports, uh, football in particular. And, you know, New Milford, Pompton Lakes, we talk about it all the time. Last year, all of us were up there for the first-ever NJIC championship game. That was Hasbro Heights against Pompton Lakes. We all love Hirschfield Park. It's played in the day. It's played on grass. It's an old-school setting, a uh, great field, everything else, and you were up there really for one of the biggest games of the NJIC schedule so far this year. Uh, New Milford 27, Pompton Lakes 20, after it was 8-7 at halftime. So uh, barn burner for the final 24 minutes. Uh, just, you know, the first half was a little bit of a struggle. Momentum you saw at first, you know, we see New Milford score, we're thinking, oh, it looks like they're going to roll. They're going to blow them out. And all of a sudden, Pompton comes back, gets their score. And it was kind of, you know, a little sloppy at times, some turnovers here and there, but really picked it up in the second half. And I think most of the players, especially in the middle, for it really seemed to gel. They had a couple kids hurt. You'll hear in some of the interviews where some of the kids were hurt. Um, and so they had to adapt. And Coach even says that when we talked to Coach, where he had to, you know, go to more passing with Ryan Picknick because, you know, there were a couple of running guys got nicked up. Number one, I forget his name, got he was out on ice. And then even our guy there, uh, Bart Nov- Novato, who he ran a big time last week, this week, he was a little nicked up too. So they had to throw a little bit, but then they came back to the running in the fourth quarter. So they, they seemed to basically, the game went back and forth, second half, and they really were able to execute, final drive, come down, 80-yard drive, and they get the game-winning touchdown. And eh, still, coming back the other way, you know, even, even after that. You know, Pompton Lakes get the ball they drive, you know, and they're coming down the field. I'm like, oh, maybe they could tie it. And, but, you know, I just got picked off, and so you didn't. So these games are really good. Both teams are pretty good. You hear from the coach, this is great football. You know, they love it. Great venue, great atmosphere, very competitive. You know, these schools are always reloading and always seem to be very competitive. So it's exciting. What more can you ask for? A beautiful day, beautiful game, and uh, very competitive going down the answer. So without, for, without further ado, let's hear from the head coach of the New Milford Fight Knights, former guest here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. Here's Billy Wild. Brian Carr here. I'm up in uh, Pompton Lakes with Coach Billy Wild from New Milford. After a really exciting 27-20 win over the Cardinal. Talk about the game, Coach. What do you think? Great game. I'll tell you what, it went four quarters. It always does with these guys. These guys have a lot of pride up here. We take our hats off Pompton Lakes. This guy's got all the rings in the last 10 years. So, you know, this this is a rough place to come, you know, and to win up here was, was a great win for our program. We're very excited about it. You know, we went four quarters, and, and you know, our, our guys just played for four quarters. We told them at halftime we, we, we made a lot of mistakes, but we played for four quarters, and that's what counts. It was a back-and-forth game. They were up at half. Yeah. You get up, cover yeah. score, two TDs. They come back, tie. Yeah. You come back and score two TDs. Great game back and forth. Yeah, the turnovers are key. You know, in the beginning of the game, there, the turnovers. We had, we had a couple guys get hurt. We have a kid. We had a kid break his hand on Wednesday. Get a cast put on his hand. He snapped with his left hand. And we didn't have one bad snap. What did he say about snapping with his other hand? Well, I was going to move him to tackle, and he said, "No, no, no, coach. I'm going to snap lefty." And I said, wow, if you can do that, God bless you. And we didn't have one bad snap in practice, and he came out here. And this game, shotgun left you, too. Wow. It was amazing. Talk about your quarterback. You really seem to be throwing the ball well today. He, he nice got shooting. into a groove in the second half. We started getting some backs hurt. Molina went down with a shoulder. The little guy, Bart, had a bad shoulder. He's not a big guy. So we can't, these guys are, are big physical kids. So we said to Ryan, hey, listen, we're going to have to throw this thing. You're going to have to run this thing. You're going to win the game. Matt's going to win the game. The senior's here to win the game. We're not going to put it on the younger kids, you know? Right. And they did. They took over in the second half. Big interception that kind of yeah. sealed the victory yeah. right oh, yeah. there. We needed uh, Klein had oh, that big interception. Klein's been playing great for the three-year starter for us. Uh, we love him. He's make him, made a big catch. He's just a very, very good athlete, very smart, and uh, we're, we're proud of him. Good stuff there with Billy Wild. And he mentioned, you know, they had to throw the ball a little bit more, Bry. So uh, what else do you do but talk to the quarterback, I guess, right? And here he is, Ryan Pickenich, after New Milford's win over Pompton. Brian Carr here up in uh, Pompton Lakes. I'm here with Ryan Pickenich. Big game for New Milford, 27-20. Tell me how you feel after the big game. It was it was an amazing game. We played our hearts out, and 
and we came out this we came out here we were really, really emotional and we came out and we just got the job done anything you did at halftime you guys were trailing by a point eight seven mm -hmm. had some momentum early and then second half anything different you guys did yeah we, we tried uh to run a little weak side away from their their stronger guys yeah. and that really helped us move the ball get first downs on them Talk about big TD pass you uh, through to tie the score, going down the other end after the fourth quarter. Uh, talk about that. Um, what did you think on that play? Yeah, our running backs were a little beat up, and we needed to go to the air. So it was uh, just a basic quick slant. He beat this man, and he scored. All right, that'll wrap it up from Pompton Lakes there. Our boy Richie Ballgame Barton also on hand. He did the story and pictures. So uh, North Jersey had NorthJerseySports.com had that one covered top to bottom for sure. And it's interesting because that puts now New Milford in the driver's seat in their division. As we know, the top four teams in each division of the NJIC make the playoffs. So, Jimmy, take us through a little bit here. You are a connoisseur of Group 1 football, as am I. So uh, what does that game do? You know, Give us the overview of what's going on around the NJIC. Well, we start off in the Colonial Division. It looks like a 2 horse race between undefeated Rutherford, who's 4-0, 4-0 in the league. You know, we some people thought they might take a step back with, without Brandon Gregory's favorite play, all-time player, <laughs> right. Kevin Kazakowski, but they're back at 4-0, showing what a program they have established. And surprising Manchester, who is 4-0 overall and 3-0 and and in the division, and it looks like those two will battle it out for first place. Uh, moving into the Meadowlands division, it's always how Restful year in and year out. Hasbrook Heights got to jump on that division last week with a 34 nothing win over Cresco. And, you know, Josiah Purdy, who we mentioned last year as a sophomore, we, we kept an eye on him, waiting for him to develop as a junior. And all he does the other night is go out and score five touchdowns, a punt return for a touchdown, two rushing touchdowns, two receiving touchdowns. So he might be the most talented player in the division. Cresco, you know, tough, always there. They lost their quarterback to injury early in the game. So, you know, right now with a win over St. Mary's already, it looks like Hasbro Kites is in the driver's seat in the Meadowlands division. In the Liberty division, you have Hawthorne and New Milford. New Milford 2-0 and in the division, undefeated. And Hawthorne's 3-1 and in the league. So it looks to, to come down to those two. Obviously, Pompton Lakes, who has one loss, but they should go through the rest. So it's going to be probably New Milford, Pompton Lakes. And in the Patriot division, it's Emerson and Wallinson. Uh, Emerson with a two-touchdown win over Woodridge. And surprising, Wallinson is 3-0. and So it looks to be Emerson and Wallinson fighting it out for the top spot in the Patriot division. Funny you should mention Emerson and Wallington there, Jimmy, because you and I got to spend some quality time together on a brilliant Sunday afternoon in southern Bergen County. We were there at Woodridge High School, uh, you know, on Sunday for the much anticipated Emerson Woodridge matchup. And, you know, we were, you know, let's, let's just bring our conversation that we were having mostly during the game onto the air here. Yeah, it, so nice to see Emerson, which has struggled as of late, uh, last couple of years. Last year they got it to five and five, but I think, you know, the, the, the last winning season they had to put it in my story somewhere. I don't have it directly here in front of me. But it's been a while, and you know, Group One football—that's the way it goes. Sometimes you, you you just don't have the uh, you know the, the the weapons to compete. But when you get a good class or a good couple classes that back each other up, you ride the wave forward. Emerson's been waiting for this group, and now all of a sudden, here they are, 27-13 over Woodridge uh, on the road. A good win for them. Now going into Wallington, which is a great, you know, similar ride itself, uh, you know, from state championship a few years ago, back into obscurity, now back again. That's the fun of Group 1 football. Yeah, you mentioned with Emerson, you know, uh, Ryan Shaw led him yesterday with two touchdowns. He's been their big uh, runner this year uh, to go to 4-0. and But, you know, mentioning Woodridge, it was a great environment on a Sunday, only game in town. The, the stands were full. You saw a lot of coaches from the NJIC there watching the game, obviously better than watching the Giant game. Yeah. But, uh, you know, for Woodridge, you know, they were at the door, just couldn't get over the hump. I'd like to mention, you know, quarterback Mike, Mike Jean Caspro, a gutsy performance. I mean, he, he took some shots. Took some shots. The game. I mean, some big-time shots. And he's a tough kid, very competitive kid. 
And, you know, Woodridge has a, has the ability, the potential to win their next two, get to four and two, and, and, and hopefully, you know, get in the playoffs because that would be a, a nice step forward for Woodridge. Yeah, absolutely. But Emerson, uh, you know, Emerson was a little bit more of the complete team. They were able to establish yeah. the run. They were able to throw it a couple of times when they needed to. But I think the big thing was it was just the pressure they were able to put on Gene Caspro uh, all day. I mean, he, he just didn't have any time to throw the football. No, he was he was certainly running for his life. He was sitting in there and, and, and took some big shots. I mean, even on the one touchdown pass, he got – he got bent backwards as he threw the ball and was fortunate enough to complete the pass. You know, I think I think uh, Emerson is a nice team. I think they have, obviously, 4-0. They have a heads-up getting into the playoffs. You know, it, it, it's still to be seen whether or not they can play physically with the new Milford, the Hasbro Kites, the Pompton Lakes. But, uh, you know, they're 4-0, and, and, and that's all they could be at this point. So yeah. they're really having a good season. Yeah, and it's a huge test because, you know, a lot of people were pointing to the Woodridge game as a pivotal one. Uh, they got it, and now they turn around and go to, you know, fight for the outright division lead against Wallington. So let's see if they can do it on back-to-back weeks. Not saying they can't. We've just never seen it. Uh, you know, they haven't been in this position. So uh, it's definitely going to be interesting there. Brian, you got any more thoughts on the NJIC uh, before uh, we turn to one, the – noticing... Go ahead. Just one um... – um, just uh, one note there. I know Jimmy mentioned that he thought uh, in the Liberty, uh, New Milford and um, uh, uh, geez, uh, Hawthorne. Think, Hawthorne and Hawthorne. Hawthorne. New, yeah, New Milford and Hawthorne, but they already played and uh, New Milford beat them. So New Milford just has to continue to play out, and they could win that division uh, because they already played Hawthorne. So sorry. yes, but um, yeah, I mean, you guys kind of covered it. I I did see Heights there at the end, and like Jimmy said, Purdy. He was, like, everywhere. And the one thing I noticed there, he never – normally they don't put him in the backfield. Uh, normally he's got a wide receiver. And they had him in the backfield because they lost their one uh, – Monaghan um, was a – he went back to Beckton. Monaghan was the running back they had in the preseason. So they now put Purdy in the backfield. And he was running all over the field in the second half. They, the guys couldn't even catch him. Uh, and then he had a really nice pass, too, in the second half. He caught one, toe-touched on the sideline. So Purdy really stood out in that game. Um, so, they, you know. Heist looks really good. Uh, obviously, Kresko, like Jimmy said, was missing that one receiver. But I think this week, maybe you got to catch Wallington Emerson. They, that's a match uh, coming up on, I think it's Friday. Friday night. So we'll have yep. to look at that. Friday night. Friday Emerson. night. That may, be the, that may be the game to check out uh, there this week. Yeah, and, you know, we're, we're so focused in. And, listen, it's a great job by the NJIC that they have us focused in on their playoff structure, their league playoff structure, which is great. But, you know, PowerPoints have also come out, and, you know, for a lot of teams, some teams anyway, they've played four games. That's halfway through the schedule that counts for state tournament qualifications and seeding. And all those teams that we're talking about, Emerson, New Milford, Hasbrookites, Wallington, Woodridge, Crescale, Pompton Lakes, all playing North 1 Group 1 this year. So, you know, they're playing each other for that coveted, one of those coveted four spots in the NJIC playoffs, but also for the you know one of those coveted eight spots and home games and everything else when it comes to uh, state tournament play. So you know just because they may not any one of the, those given teams that we were talking about may have you know not necessarily eliminated, but not uh, in, in control of their own destiny as far as the NJIC playoffs go. Certainly uh, a long way to go before we figure out everything that's going to go on in the state tournament. So that's going to be fun to file for the rest mm-hmm. of the year. All right. Let's move over to the North Jersey Super Football Conference here. Uh, and a lot of interesting games this past week. Again, we were able to get to a bunch. And, Bry, well, all three of us were there uh, on Thursday night, the week opening game, uh, 6 o'clock start at Northern Valley Regional Old Tapan High School in Old Tapan. And, Bry, they, they, they're, the Knights just make it look easy. I mean, this was supposed to be their biggest test of the year. And, again, they got to a running clock. Yeah, they're uh, they they look like the team that beat in the uh, group four, uh, very dominating program, undefeated four games this year. So you know, we expected a little bit more from Ridgewood, uh, but looks like you know the Knights are very solid this year. You know, two guys. You know, we always say in the audit, we wrote the story. They're a collection of talented players. There's typically no one star, two stars in the team like they used to have the Fullers in there, uh, or a um, John Trainer and that kind of guy. But they have a good bunch of kids, and Marquise Antonari, you have Aiden Balali, these two guys that you know came through 
uh, and it already had three TDs in the first half, and then uh, Aiden had two as well. So, I mean, it, they were they almost had a running clock in the first half there. So really dominating their offensive line is solid. You know, the kids up front, uh, they're well-rounded. But now the challenge, like we mentioned earlier today, talking, they got to keep kids healthy. There seems to be some kids nicked in the line. So hopefully they can, you know, rest those guys when it comes to playoff time. So, yeah, yeah, very, well, very I, good. Very impressed. Yeah. You got two two quotes that we're going to use, two uh, sound bites that we're going to use from that game, and then I want to get to Jimmy about how to handle the season the rest of the way. I'm curious to get his thoughts, uh, to put his coaching hat back on. But you you caught it. You mentioned Aiden Balali. Uh, you mentioned Marquez Antonori. Let's start with Marquez here. Here are his thoughts after the comfortable win, 35 to seven, at home on Thursday night over Ridgewood. Brian Carr here. I've been um, off the pan here at Marquez Antonori. Uh, big game for you guys, 35-7 over Ridgewood. What do you think? Team played pretty well. Yeah, you know, it all starts with the offensive line. You know, big shout-out to Kuz, Mike Mancuso, Paulie, everybody, the whole line. They make it happen for all the skill players, so good job to them. Good, good. Yeah. It was pretty much a pretty dominating effort for you guys. You know, it's I didn't see much of a situation where you guys were going to be stopped. You had four drives, 50 yards or more, and scored four times. So it's uh, yeah, you know, it's it's a team effort. All week we're working hard. All every week or every this week we right. work hard. Um, you know, it was a short week, so yeah. had to get everything done right the first time. No mistakes. So we're ready for next week. I think big interception by Aiden. Yeah, you know, yeah. You guys were up 14, then, I think, and he got a big pick six for about 40 yards. Yeah, um, Aiden's a dominant player. You know, he's always working hard at practice, doing what he has to do. Very focused. And, you know, he's a big defensive player on that team. So. All right. Interesting stuff there with Marquez Antonori. He just keeps scoring. But, you know, Brian, you did mention that they are a collection of outstanding players. You know, on any given week, it could be one of a number of players. You know, Sal Di Benedetto has had a great start to the season. You know, Nick McNerney at quarterback has been doing great things. And Aiden Balali, too. Speed on the outside. You caught up with him after the game. Here's Aiden Balali. Brian Carr here with Aiden Bali after a big ultimate win, 35-7. Aiden, talk about the game, talk about the team. Uh, we're all doing our job. We're doing, we're doing everything we need to do. We're covering our keys. The linemen, the defensive backs, and the, and the linebackers are all working together. You had a nice pick six, 40-yard interception. Tell me about that play. What did you do on the play to, to get that interception? Ball's in the air. That's, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go for it. So when the ball's in the air, it's our ball. Like, no one else is getting it. It's us. <laughs> talk about your TD run uh, late there and uh, talk about that one. Yeah, just, uh, just got to f- focus on, like, just reading blocks and cuts and just going, getting right into the end zone. Good. So how does it feel so far? You're 4-0, probably one of the top teams in the county. Yeah. Uh, being an undefeated Ridgewood team, how does that feel? feels good, but, again, we're just focused on every every week. This week's done. We're on to the next one. We're just going to keep going from there. Hey, Jimmy, last thing about Old Japan there. You know, halfway through their season for games that count for the state tournament, uh, with a favorable schedule the rest of the way, you know, they're 4-0, and we know that Brian Dunn is an ultra-competitive coach, and he's not going to, you know, he's not going to pull back the range just yet. It's way too early in the season. But their next three games at Fairlawn, home against Teaneck, and then at Northern Highlands, which, you know, Northern Highlands having a decent season, and then home against Indian Hills before the state cutoff, and then Ramapo after the state cutoff. That's a fine line here, because as Brian mentioned, they got some guys hurt on the offensive line, and injuries could be their biggest opponent here before the state playoffs get started. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any question. I mean, obviously their numbers aren't terrific. I, they're in the low 40s. You mentioned a couple of banged up guys, but you know the goal is to set you up possibly with the number one seed to guarantee yourself the two home games. I think Coach Dunn goes out there, you know, tries to keep the pedal to the metal, tries to go out there, win the next four games, get the eight and zero if he possibly can. The Ramapo game, which would be an interesting game almost becomes not, not so much a a uh, an important game. I mean, obviously, every game you play, you want to win. But Yeah, and it's it, bragging it's rights. Question. I mean, it's old Japan, Ramapo, yeah. the old NBIL rivalry, you know. Yeah, the question becomes, the are you tempted 
to rest a couple of kids that day. You know, it, it seems to be that's the fad with a lot of programs. You know, that night game, if it doesn't mean anything, PowerPoint-wise, you know, do you rest them? I think that becomes the interesting thing. You also, you know, you want to keep the role going. They've been so efficient, not only offensively, defensively. And, you know, the court, their quarterback, McNerney, has been tremendous. He's completing over 70% of his passes. He really runs the offense tremendously well. And, you know, what people don't notice is his speed. He can really run also. So that's another weapon. But, uh, you know, so far, midway through the season, Old Japan looks like the dominant team in that section. Yeah, they do look like the dominant team. You, you, I'm looking at the PowerPoints. I got them here in front of me. After that, you got the teams out west. You got West Morris. You got Mount Olive. Uh, Morris Hills, Passaic Valley, who I want to mention a little bit later. They're off to a 3-1 and one start. But, you know, Wayne Hills is in that bracket. Old Japan's already beaten them 35 nothing. Not saying that it would be that easy in the state playoffs, because we know it won't be. I mean, Wayne Hills, Old Japan in the state playoffs, it's going to be a, a, a good game no matter how you slice it. But, you know, it, it really, this situation where Old Japan has to manage uh, playing guys versus not playing guys in games that don't mean anything when you're talking about the Rampo game, that used to be the Thanksgiving Day game against Demarest. You know, I remember a couple years ago, Old Japan rested some people. Demarest beat them, and guess what, Jimmy? They don't play on Thanksgiving anymore. Yeah, that, so, you know, that was a game where Coach Dunn, you know, decided to rest the starters. I know Demarest went up there with their starters, and I, if I remember correctly, they beat up Old Japan. Yep. But, you know, the ultimate goal was the state championship for Old Japan, and, and that was more important to them. Yeah, and you can understand it from the Demarest side of it. Listen, that's the rivalry game. That was the Thanksgiving Day game. Let's go out and try to win it. So, you know, there's no easy answers when it comes to North Jersey high school football scheduling or Jer- the state of New Jersey high school football scheduling in general, and that's uh, why we are where we are in, in, at certain points here. I just mentioned Demarest, and I saw them on Friday afternoon, another Friday matinee, and here's what we know about Demarest. They can score the football. The one game they lost, they're off to a 3-1 and one start, the one game that they lost uh, was to Rampo, and they lost handily, but yet they sc- still scored 35 points in that game. So, um, you know, they they have a lot of offensive weapons. They got Austin Alberici at quarterback, uh, a very heady player, you know, a kid who will go through his progressions, pick out his receivers. Uh, Bright, Demarest looking pretty good early on. Yeah, yeah, we we saw them. We saw them in the preseason. They looked really good. You know, the offense, like you said, can score. So now it's, you know, later as you move down along and during the season, it's all about a little defense, too. So, uh, you know, once you get up, you're going to probably likely get in Sparta in there. Um, you know, Rallapo will be back in their group. So Riverdale is in their group, you know, for an out team. So, yep. you know, Demers has got to get some defense going to kind of go with their good offense as they have uh, coming to Yes, I caught up with a couple of Demarest players after the 49-14 victory over Bergenfield on Friday. First of The first of them was Brandon Leo, and you mentioned the defense. He had two interceptions, helped force a fumble, so he was he had his hand in three separate turnovers for the Demarest defense. Let's hear what Brandon Leo had to say after the game. Uh, I mean, we had a short week of practice, and we had to cramp in a lot of new calls and new defensive alignments. And I thought well, the whole team rallied up, and we, we did a really good job this week. Preparation-wise, we were good. We were swarming good today, and we all played, and we really wanted it. I thought you guys did well, too. They run a lot of misdirection. You guys mm-hmm. stayed home, put them in some bad situations, and forced them to throw the ball, which I didn't want to do. Yeah. So Coach, B put us, yeah Coach B put us in great position to make plays, great calls. Um, yeah, it was a great win for us today. So talk about the mood around Demers now. Three and one, quarter, um, a little bit more than a quarter of the way through. The I season. mean, we're, we're definitely going to be confident. You know, we have our goals in mind. But, you know, the main thing is not being complacent and just keep doing it every other week. All right, that was Brandon Leo, the Demarest defensive back who uh, had his hand in three different turnovers for the Norsemen. And then I caught up with head coach Tony Matola. Uh, it was a beautiful Friday afternoon. Game played on the... Uh, natural grass surface behind Bergenfield High School with that kind of, 
you know, those stands over there are 1950s-esque. It made me harken back to the old days. Uh, and you'll hear some of that as I get into it with Tony Matola in this interview I did with him after the game. You know, to come here and, and play the way that we did, we're on a short week. You know, we're, I, I couldn't be more proud of the kids, and especially defensively with, you know, we turned the ball over on the first drive. And, um, you know, if they come out of there with points, you never know what happens with this game. But we, you know, we intercepted the ball and got the momentum back. And just, uh, you know, anytime you can win a football game, that's a good thing. So we're, we're, we're really happy at this point. Is it like 1950? Sun's out, grass, field. I mean, <laughs> it Richie is. Cunningham I'm, I'm looking for Richie Cunningham, you know, <laughs> looking for Potsy. I mean, it was, to be, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm thrilled with both administrations because it was really a playoff type of an atmosphere. You know, Bergenfield let their kids out. We had five or six uh, buses of kids. And, you know, this is, what, this is what you sign up for when you do high school football. And I was just really happy that the kids were able to experience this and then to come out of it with a win. It's even better. You know what we're noticing walking around seeing all these games is there's a lot of parity. You know, uh, you know, I think old Japan is on another level, but everybody yeah. else is on you know, the, the good teams are, yeah. are on a similar level. Hey, where do you think you 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 guys fit into this mix here? Um not really sure. You know, I, I um listen. I'm going to take it day by day. You know, that's going to be my answer. I'm, I'm not looking ahead. We're not looking behind. We're just, we got to take each day. And I yell to the kids, you know, be perfect on this rep. That, that's all we want to do. We want to win each rep um, and be perfect on each rep. And that, that's kind of how we take it, just one step at a time. We don't look ahead. And, you know, if we're in the mix at the end, then we're in the mix at the end. But we got to, you know, now we got to get ready for Indian Hills. Was there a cliche that you didn't use that you would like to squeeze in now? While you have um, no, I, I'm going to save some for your, for your podcast. <laughs> All right, that sums up the audio portion of this edition of the Monday Morning Quarterback. That's all the clips we have for this week. But we would be remiss if we didn't mention some of the other winners from around North Jersey games that we were not able to attend but certainly want to mention. And I'll start, and I'm going to go first because we had DJ Nymphius on the show last week. Uh, Riverdale on a short week, early bus ride, four-hour trip to Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, they left 3-0. and They came back 4-0 and after a 36-19 victory over a uh, Pennsylvania public school, so a good one for them. Jimmy, which ones did I miss that you wanted to talk about? I wanted to mention Coach uh, Brooks Alexander in the Pascal Kills Cowboys, a big win over Mawa, 20-7, uh, and 3-1 on the year. And I'll tell you what, one of the great coaches in northern New Jersey probably doesn't have the best talent year in, year out, but a great guy. Does the best with what he has, and uh, you know, three and one. So they're they're really doing a good job. Yeah, he stayed put at that program. He takes what he has year in and year out. And listen, they they might not have winning seasons every year, but they win as many games as they're supposed to. So uh, he does. He does. Uh, well, we we should you know put him on the list here and keep an eye on him and maybe have him on uh, later on in the season. Bry, how about you? Um, we're just kind of staying with last week. We had uh, Dwight Morrow coach on last week, and they ran into a really tough Paramus team who's been very, you know, battle-tested, played Ridgewood to a tough, uh, they lost to them, I think, in overtime. Yep. And Paramus kind of came into the, you know, and took on the uh, Red Raiders and really put a lick into them. So uh, they took them down from the undefeated, and uh, so Paramus now is in the mix of the PowerPoints after a big 35-6 victory over um, Dwight Morrow. Uh, that was, yeah, no, that I, I, mean, I, I hope we didn't put the kibosh on Englewood because they go, uh, they host Ramapo this week. That's going to be a tough one for them. And we probably underrated Paramus a little bit because, you know, they open the season, new coach, Joey Sabella takes over there, uh, and then they go out and lose to Old Japan. That loss does not look <laughs> bad now at all as Old Japan has established itself as probably the best public school team in North Jersey. So Paramus took one on the chin to open, and then they lose to Ridgewood in overtime, and now two straight wins back to two and two, and certainly right in the thick of things uh, in terms of playoff positioning. So uh, good job job by Joey Sabella, and I know, that Jimmy, that's probably a guy we should have on somewhere down the road here too. Um, the other game I wanted to mention was Ramapo now 3-1 and one after a 44-8 win over Pascag Valley. Pascag Valley was coming off its first win of the season. Uh, they fell to one and three, and uh, Pasig Valley now three and one after a twenty-three to thirteen victory over Orange. And I don't mean to steal your thunder, Bry, because I know this is a team your uh, your beloved opponent on the Thanksgiving Day affair with the hometown Dumont Huskies. Tenafly is off the Schneid, fifty-five thirty-three victory over Marist, and Jimmy, they look good doing it. 
Yeah, listen, anytime you can score 55 points, you're doing a good job. And, you know, it's good for Coach. Picked up his first career win. And, you know, Tennessee has been a, one of those teams that has been behind the eight ball as a program because just the, the mixture of kids, the town is, is not, you know, what it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. And they're out there competing every weekend. So, you know, obviously we're very happy for the Tigers at Tennessee. Yes, that's that. And it, Indian Hills also got its first win of the season, 25-19 over Fairlawn in overtime, right? As, as Sam Bruno would say for the Tigers, go Tigers. Sam Bruno would support that win for the Tigers. So good for the Tigers. That will be the last word. Sam Bruno's a rallying cry for the fighting Tenafly Tigers. We'll see you next week on the Monday Morning Quarterback. Follow the leader.